Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 8, titled Better Living Through Chemistry. One of the longer names of Miami Vice for a name of an episode. There's no better living in this episode, so spoiler. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. There's none of that. It originally premiered on November 14th, 1986. It was directed by Liani Chasso, who we know very well. He directed Little Miss Dangerous and Kill Shot. So two kind of off the beaten path Miami Vice episodes, and this is another one, Better Living Through Chemistry, where it's you know, it's a little different than what the normal Miami Vice episode is. It brings in a little different lifestyle. This one's heavy on on the interesting lifestyle because we got a full dose of Izzy. Yes. <laughs> the writers are Ken Edwards and Larry Rosenthal. And they have this is where I'll stop just normally I don't talk about the writers that much, but I'll just stop for a second here. Ken Edwards and Larry Rosenthal didn't do much work other than write this episode of Miami Vice. I don't spend a lot of time talking about the teleplay writers, but their job is to take the script and convert it into something that's usable and readable on set. And that could be just changing some lines. It could be just converting it to make it like words easier for the actors to say or or change it for like something they would normally say or might even be change the scene because they don't have access to a sawmill. So they're going to rewrite the scene to make it so that they can be at a at a different type of mill or something like that. The teleplay writers for this are Dick Wolf and Michael Duggan. They are both producers of this show. So something happened from script to filming where Dick Wolf and another producer felt like they had to get involved. Yeah, they had to come in and fix mm-hmm. it all up for everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that might might explain uh, the goofy nature and where there's some parts of the story where we just make big leaps all of a sudden. Yeah, there's no explanation. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah th- th- this episode definitely felt off, too. Especially the way the season's been going. It, it just felt like uh, like out of sequence, almost. So when you say the producers had to come in and, re- and write the teleplay, they might have had to rescue this episode. Just maybe. All speculation here. We don't know. It's just something I noticed when I was putting together the notes for this. Before we get started, I could check in with someone's going to each other's lives. And guys, it's been a while since we've talked about why we do this podcast. We originally started Go With The Heat as a reason for us to get together and we would talk about a TV show. We decided on Miami Vice because me and John, and when we started the show originally, Jenna was our first co-host. We decided that we would watch a show that we had never seen before. Miami Vice is the, the definition of pop culture and set the status quo, not only for police shows, but what is considered to be a fashionable show on TV, be up with current events when it comes to music and lifestyle and clothing, it was always goes back to Miami Vice. And all of us knew what Miami Vice was, but had never seen it before. At the beginning of season... It also helps that we had someone closely related to us who <laughs> had extremely deep knowledge of the show and access to every season available for us to watch. <laughs> well, yeah, at the beginning of season two, Melissa came on the show, and she is our our guide along Miami Vice to not only to help us understand the show better and to set us straight when we lead astray, when we get led astray and make (laughs) presumptions about the show, but also to be a guide for us and what was happening in the 80s at that time. Someone who's in tune with popular culture. Yes, because I'm older than you guys. (laughs) John was a fetus when this show came out, so (laughs) he was just a baby. (laughs) Yes, and for the record, I'm not that much older. I was not supposed to be watching it when I was watching it when it was new. I was I was a kid, and my parents were like, "You're not supposed to watch that show." Well, I got a TV in my room. You can't stop me. (laughs) Well, me, John come from the perspective of we've never seen it before, so we're experiencing it for, for the first time 30 years after it came out, and. You you're watching it for the fifth or sixth time, and yeah. you're you're. I guess what's for me is what what's interesting is that you're seeing things that you never noticed before because me and John are pointing them out, yeah. and then you are course correcting us like, hey, you guys are putting too much emphasis into this, or you're not paying attention to the bigger picture that it is that yeah, we're talking about. You know, yeah, because I've seen it before, I know the outcome, so I'm like in my head like when you're saying like this, I'm like that's not gonna matter, <laughs> and then yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, or when you're like, well, this should show up in an episode later on. That I'm like, nope. <laughs> that you also give us a perspective yeah. on how much we because for a long time you were critical of us on how we treated the b team and 
you're yep. you are a staunch supporter of all of the people that yeah, are I on the everybody. vice team. Yeah. And you make sure you set us straight when we try start giving <laughs> someone too much crap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, yeah, when I would listen to your guys other when, with, with Jenna, it would be like, You guys have no idea. Why do you even watch the show? You don't even deserve the B team. <laughs> so I I think a little bit of our history as just TV viewers plays into it too, because me and Dominic are very opposite when it comes to what we watch. Dominic, you generally just watch cartoons like The Simpsons. Like, Is there anything else? on TV much. other than The Simpsons? Well, you watch Seinfeld and you watch like very particular, but he, he picks things he likes and he only watches those things over and over again. Yes. He's very reluctant to watch Exa- new things. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I would say I'm much more like Melissa in the fact that I watch a very broad amount of different TV, you know, but I also watch a lot of a lot of cop procedural shows. Well, we hope everyone enjoys our unique perspectives, as John mentioned, coming from watching a lot of cop shows, but never seeing my advice. Me, having never watched, has, having never watched any show that's like this, ever. And then Melissa, who comes, who's the super fan, coming from, who understands not only episode to episode, but the culture behind it, uh, having a huge fan of the actors that are in the show and not just the show but of like the individual music and everything that <laughs> oh comes my along God. with it. we still haven't talked about his music yet that's my favorite part <laughs> <laughs> that's we just wanted to give a little bit of background on the show because it's just been a long time since we've talked about that like why we do this show uh very happy that we are on episode 60 of crazy go with the heat so mm-hmm. enough about us let's go talk about this episode of miami vice all right, so we open up at the strangest biker bar I have ever seen. There's, I mean, yes, it is a biker bar, but man, there's a lot of Hawaiian shirts and mustaches. I mean, it's 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 like they couldn't decide: are we a Miami bar or are we a biker bar? Or I thought it was a strip club. Yeah, it could be a strip club too. It's pretty big. That's a big strip club. Well, they had all those girls dancing everywhere. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> strip clubs in the '80s were apparently very strange, but whatever. <laughs> Crockett is there. He's with. Uh, he's working undercover. Izzy is also there too, and he is with someone who is, at this point, as we know him to be, incredibly dumb. <laughs> he's just, <laughs> and Izzy makes a point to go talk to two other people and say, "Yes, he is dumb. Please excuse my man. He is dumb." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just kind of got this goober like look on his face. He's just, you know. <laughs> we realize later that part of the problem might be he doesn't speak English, so <laughs> he may not know what's happening. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> Izzy goes upstairs. He goes to talk to the DJ. This particular club, the DJ is like in this elevated, almost like a sphere in the middle of the dance floor. And he's up there talking to the DJ and he's saying that he's there with the chemist and he only, quote, conglomerates with intellectuals now. <laughs> oh, Izzy, we love you so much. <laughs> he considers himself intellectual. So, yeah, you know. <laughs> And the DJ says, yeah, it's cool. Can you get lost? Yeah, like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> in the meantime, Tubbs comes walking in. He's got someone with him. And they go walking out to go meet Crockett. I love when they have to pretend like they don't know each other. That's the best part. It really is. I love yeah. it. Like, that, that. that's the best episodes where they're like, hey, we don't know each other. But, like, wink, wink. <laughs> Crockett's like, it's okay, man. I really know you. Like, it's like it. a couple doing, like, a role play yeah, date night. exactly. Yeah, because they're not very good at it. <laughs> When Tubbs comes walking in, the DJ sees him, and he gets all excited. He runs over to the microphone, and he turns the spotlight on Tubbs, and then he announces over the intercom, we have one of New York's finest in the club. Uh, not excited like, hey, I'm excited to see you. Excited like, I'm going to blow his cover excited. That's yeah. what that was about. <laughs> yeah. And so then yeah. Cro- yeah. Crockett, and as we know the man later to find out his name is Wango, <laughs> Crockett and Wango <laughs> leave. <laughs> If we go to the opening credits. I, and I love like when he when he lights him up, I was expecting like, and hey, welcome to the stage, Ricardo. <laughs> you know? Like, total strip club announcement style. Um, I think it's funny because they, they introduce Tubbs as the cop. Like everyone's with a deal, like just kind of splits, you know, like like, oh my god, he's a cop. They they just kind of split and then we come back from the open a few in a few scenes later, and it's like everything's cool again, like no big deal. It just brought a cop to the to the meeting. You know? <laughs> yeah, ignore that. I didn't know he was a cop. Please believe me. <laughs> yeah, and when they announce he's a cop, then Crockett pretends like he's like he's gonna grab him. 
He's like, yeah. oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get him right now, you know. And then, and then the, <laughs> the other guy Wango was like, no, no, leave him alone, just let him go. Not now, not, not now. now. And I forgot to mention that the deal yeah. that Crockett is working is Wango is selling synthetic cocaine, which is a hot button topic in the '80s. So that's a rip from the headlines, where because there was a big concern about synthetic drugs in the '80s. This one, especially because the, the formula that they're trying to make would be actually legal. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. The B team, Castillo, the duo are all together. They've been working this case for six months, and they feel like it's slipping away now. And Tub starts which, talking about... Did, which, you know, you think they've been working it for six months. They might have looked into who the who might be employed at the club. <laughs> you know? uh, any ex-New York detectives who might have been partnered <laughs> with someone undercover. <laughs> yeah, because surprise, the DJ is... Tubbs' former NYPD partner who got dismissed after an IA investigation for shooting a bookie during a numbers investigation. That he just happened to owe some money to. (laughs) Not suspicious at all. Tubbs rails on that his partner, Clarence. Clarence said he had a gun, and so he he shot the bookie. And Tubbs testified to IA that he never saw a gun. He never... So he, he testified honestly, which that will... That's a big deal. That'll come back in this episode. Mm-hmm. About mm-hmm. Tubbs' honesty and where Crockett stands with that. That's another <laughs> point. <laughs> you leave Crockett alone. <laughs> all Castillo <laughs> wants to know is, is why is he mixed up with this biker gang? Because he was like, I don't give a crap about all that stuff. <laughs> my mustache is slowly growing <laughs> into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go get this investigated. <laughs> <laughs> my mustache is taking over on half of my face. <laughs> The B team suggests that maybe you should talk to Izzy because he's mixed up with the chemist. And they both go, yeah, we know because we're the ones that set that up. Like, no shit. shit. (laughs) (laughs) But they're off to go see Izzy anyway. So we head over to Izzy's house. Now, now, let's talk a little bit about Izzy's home. What is it? (laughs) (laughs) Like, is it a cave? Is it like paper mache? What is it? (laughs) I I don't care what the home is. He's still got all the dogs. And... The dogs are, t- they watch TV. They figured out how to turn on the TV and watch TV. Because he's still got, he's got TV, he's got the dogs because that was one of his crazy schemes that he had going with yes. Greyhounds, which whatever, they don't, they, they didn't want his Greyhounds at the Greyhound <laughs> place, which, okay. Then he's also got, he's talking about the dogs get into the video equipment because he tried to be like a videographer or something. So he's got expensive video equipment. And then he's in that house where people wrote on his walls. And I don't understand. Yeah. So, uh, couple things one it's so great that the writers left in things that are from previous episodes like with the dogs yeah right? oh no that continues too yeah that that <laughs> izzy's past the uh, business ventures are still around two his house looks normal from the outside and when you get inside it looks like a hobbit home <laughs> like all these rounded yeah. walls and like domed and then it's, it's like painted white and then it's like he went around and wrote things on the walls like graffitied it and he's in his underwear. Uh, and I swear, <laughs> not not just by his home, but all in the writing on the wall. But because of how he acts sometimes, I would swear to God that he's a druggie. He says he doesn't use, but I mean, he sure acts like... He's- no, he doesn't. <laughs> he's just not that bright. So what Izzy tells us is that he's responsible for taking care of the chemist who has like a severe social anxiety and loneliness. And it makes him so he forgets his work and he can't work on the synthetic cocaine aka he's horny <laughs> yeah true he can't find a lady <laughs> that's what that was all about i think <laughs> not only is he horny he's horny and hungry apparently <laughs> oh yeah all the time because he's a little bit chubby just a little <laughs> it's working fairly well but izzy says Hey, I honor my client's privacy and i can't be telling you two police officers what my client is up to and Croc is very quick to remind him, hey, don't forget who you work for, pal. And then he wants him to talk to his parole officer. <laughs> yeah, tell my parole officer I actually have a job. Get her off my back. <laughs> I think that's kind of messed up on on Crockett and Tubbs' part because you know, here is he's, you know, working with them. And they won't even go talk to his parole officer. He's your CI. You're supposed to take care of these things. Exactly. Well, maybe if he didn't have backdoor deals with everybody else, <laughs> they would take care of him. <laughs> but like How many anybody... times those backdoor deals help them with a case? When they tried to steal that truck? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> and it's like always like a coincidence that it works out. Well, let's face it, Izzy's a wheeler and a dealer. If if something better comes along, he's going to take the money and he's going to do it. Don't let the whole I got your car back Crockett <laughs> fool you. <laughs> I just want to know if Izzy's still stripping. That's I think that's what we all want to know. I hope not in those boxer shorts. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't attractive. They just there to remind Izzy, like, make sure you're you're giving us information. Remember why you're doing this. You're not conglomerating with intellectuals. You're getting yes. work for you're doing work for Miami Vice. So now Tubbs is off to go see his former partner. And the door is answered by a woman in her bikini. She's the motorcycle stripper. Yeah, because you know you're always you're always working essentially. Yeah, every stripper <laughs> opens their door in their bikini. They don't have it closed. No. I just want to point out we all have very many guest stars this week. But his girlfriend is played by Patty Owen, who goes by Shanti Patty Owen. And the other reason I want to bring her up is that she was on an episode of Wife Swap. And you, fa- you what you find out on, on the episode of Wife Swap is that she's also a writer and a relationship consultant. And her and, and her, I, I don't know if it's her husband or ex-husband or, or guru or however the relationship <laughs> is, they, they run a uh, site called Transformational Warriors, and they teach relationship classes, one of which teaches clients to have intimate relations while dressed in superhero costumes. <laughs> So I, I I thought that was interesting. So she's also a <laughs> John. You would think that was formal. interesting. <laughs> Google her and you'll see pi- a picture of her and like her husband. She's in like a Wonder Woman costume. So and every man is dressed as the Flash. <laughs> 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 so when Tubbs goes in, he turns the corner and there's Clarence waiting for him with his shorts pulled all the way up to his nipples. <laughs> <laughs> Those shorts were very uncomfortable. <laughs> they made me very uncomfortable. Clarence is obviously very surprised to be seeing Tubbs here all these years later, and they get immediately into an argument. Tubbs says, you almost got me killed by calling me out like that, and Clarence basically turns it around and says, I thought at one time you were supposed to take me and my family. Ouch, Clarence. Yeah, he has yeah, a very, ouch. He, he, he's got a, got a very sad sack story, you know? They took my job, my wife left me, she killed herself, they took my kid. Things went like, downhill real fast. The whole, like, yeah. she killed herself, like, she killed herself because her husband, that's a very drastic thing to do because your husband lost his job, essentially. Literally, he lost his uh-huh. job, not... Yeah. <laughs> What? No. Tubbs warns Clarence that the man he's working for is no good, but Clarence just says, thanks for the help, but I don't need your kind of help. <laughs> Clarence is a little bitter. <laughs> he, he might have something, though. I mean, come come on. Tubbs was his partner. He didn't back him up at all. In fact, he kind of <laughs> helped finger him, you know? <laughs> well, he didn't help like, finger like, him. Well, Tubbs, you were kind of a bad partner. <laughs> What the heck? <laughs> yeah, no. What's he supposed to do? Lie? Tubbs doesn't lie. He's not a liar like some other people we know who would lie. <laughs> we all know. Do, do you think Crockett. he would throw Crockett under the bus like that? No, but Crockett would would if Tubbs told him there was a gun. Crockett would go okay. I'll say there was yeah. a gun. He would lie. He would. There's something that's going to come up with that later. So we will revisit this conversation. <laughs> At Wango's bar, Crockett is still there. He's still, he's that still, funny. his cover is still working Wango. with the Wango. <laughs> yeah, Crockett's okay because he grabbed Tubbs right away and shook him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the other man that was with Tubbs is there to make a buy. So apparently they thought that Tubbs was the only police officer. So they were still good with the other man that was with Tubbs that night when they went to the club the first time. He said it's going to buy and he knows that it's going to be synthetic cocaine, but it's at a deal. It's only 12 grand a key. So and instead of doing a regular test, he's going to smoke some of it almost immediately after he smokes it. It kills him. He just drops dead. Now, he drops dead like an old person in a medical alert bracelet commercial. <laughs> I'm going down. <laughs> But the rest of Wango's gang, including the man with the tiger stripe beard. That guy's beard is so <laughs> weird. <laughs> they all don't respond. It's almost like as if they planned this. Uh, yeah, except Crockett's mm. like trying to hold in his horror, but it's not going very well. His face is shocked. <laughs> well, yeah, and I thought at first I thought they planned it. And then one of them says it must be a pH problem. And yeah, like, the- so it, it it wasn't planned. You guys just aren't very good chemists. <laughs> no, later on when the lady talks, when the the lady the chemist that works for the 
the the police or whatever. She says she goes, oh, they use him as a guinea pig. That's it. the next scene. Is yeah. that she says that Tubbs at the lab, and she says she thinks that they guinea pig the buyer, but they're really yeah, close the, to actually the, making the high tech lab that also doubles as a vet office. <laughs> <laughs> John's been there. No, I'm just <laughs> I got my medicine there once. Back at Wango's, after we had that brief stop at the lab, we go back over to Wango's. Izzy is there, and he's talking to. Another man who wants to become partners with the Wango. <laughs> the Wango. <laughs> Hispanic man who doesn't speak any English and Izzy is acting as a translator. Crockett's there the whole time, by the way. Throughout the entire episode, whenever you see Wango, Crockett is there. Because he's like his right-hand man. Yeah. Which, whatever, six months doesn't seem like that's enough time <laughs> to get you there. But if you're Crockett, you're doing something extra to get in there. <laughs> Izzy is translating. And he's, he's very uncomfortable with the conversation that's happening because the Hispanic man who we end up finding out his name is Sangres, he... Wants to become a partner, but Wango's not interested in having a partner, especially one who doesn't speak English. And Izzy uh, yeah. tells him that, and the man gets very upset. Yes, and I enjoy, and maybe it's because I've seen this situation before in real life. He says some stuff in Spanish and then leaves, and Wango asks Izzy to translate, and Izzy's got this kind of uncomfortable, like, he kind of said certain things about female members of your family. <laughs> like, I'm totally cool. It's nothing. It's not a big deal, you know. Don't worry about it. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> Clarence comes walking in. And he wants some petty cash. And Wango thanks him for pointing out tubs on the other night. So Croc is kind of just watching this. And he sees like, oh, okay, this looks an awful lot like. Clarence is working directly with directly with Wango. And then Clarence immediately goes downstairs and makes a call. He leaves a message with someone saying that, where the chemist is going to be and what time he's going to be there. It's just a it's just a message. We don't know who that's to. So who is Clarence working for? Is he working for Wango? Is he working for Sangries? What's happening here? Dun 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 <laughs> commercial break. <laughs> Downstairs in the club, we have a we have a brief dancing montage. A it's little a bit of dancing. Quality stripper <laughs> dancing montage. Izzy's back with the chemist. He's telling him that the strippers love him. That she likes you. She likes you. <laughs> that he should invite them out to dinner. And also, like, say something to him, too. Talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I know about that scenario comes back from a Chris Rock song where, you know, Mr. Chemist, Mr. Luna, there is no sex in the champagne room. <laughs> so just keep that in mind while you're there. That's timeless. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one of my favorite scenes of the episode. One of the actual decent ones. Because we get to see a couple of the Cuban gang members come in. Then just all hell breaks loose into this gun battle. It's a huge gun battle. But Clarence comes and grabs Izzy and the chemist right before it starts. They disappear. And then there's this huge shootout. In the bar where apparently only gang members get shot. And luckily, yeah, yeah. no strippers got shot. <laughs> no strippers were winged. <laughs> no one got hurt. No. Later, or it might be the next day, but later at the precinct, the door talking to Castillo. And Castillo wants Wango off the street. He doesn't want a gang war. Now, the Sangres and Wango's gangs are battling each other because of they won't, the unwillingness to make a deal. And this cheap synthetic cocaine potentially hitting the streets. So there's this big chance for a gang warfare to break out. And Crockett is wondering why Izzy and Clarence all of a sudden disappeared right before the shooting started. Yeah, he's doing police work like you guys said he never do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are all saying he never does it. Well, he's doing it. <laughs> Not Tubbs. So, and this is what we've been waiting for. Tubbs says Clarence is in that way. He used to be a cop. And Crockett says, well, he's not going to be swayed by misplaced guilt. <laughs> Crockett? Sonny. <laughs> Come on. Sonny, now. baby. We got to talk for a minute. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> That's like a that's what the whole show of Miami Vice is built on is Sonny's misplaced guilt. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, Evan, you know, that's what that whole thing yeah. is about. The other couple partners, mm-hmm. his old military buddies, you know, all those military episodes of the misplaced guilt that comes yep. along. You know, uh, uh, I mean, it just seems like Sonny, you should know about trying to protect your own people and where misplaced guilt goes, especially because of how many women that you get partnered up with that get killed, too. <laughs> Essentially, everyone important in your life gets killed, Sonny. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, maybe it's a good <laughs> thing he doesn't see his son then, huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> he's away. He walked away somewhere. He doesn't even know where he is. <laughs> he's got a son? What are you talking about? I didn't know he had a kid. I don't know. Like Billy, Timmy, something. <laughs> Something generic. <laughs> Castillo's, Castillo's just watching. Over his mustache. Yeah, his, his mustache going up his face now. It's covering his eyes. Slightly. <laughs> yeah, I love he doesn't get involved in their little quarrel. He's like, eh, whatever. You yeah. guys work it out. And then get the hell out of my office while you're at it. <laughs> tired of your crap. He is paying attention because later in the print scene, Castillo walks up and brings the investigation records into Clarence. Tub says he got turned down for him. He couldn't get his hands on him. But Castillo just says, well, this is between me and you then. Don't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs reads it and later goes into Castillo's office and says, I need to go to New York right now because there's something wrong with this paperwork. And Castillo gives him 24 hours. Castillo's being awfully generous. <laughs> I mean, come on, you got to put in a time off like way in advance. You can't just go the next day. Uh, Tubbs gets a lot done in those 24 hours. Yeah, I know. Huh? You know, I mean, he flies, he flies from, from Miami to New York, meets with the convict who basically... T- the testimony was built on to get his partner in trouble, flips him in about 30 seconds, uh, you know, and like doesn't even have to promise him anything, you know, just, <laughs> no. just kind of like, come on, Trump, tell the truth. Okay, there was a gun. Um, <laughs> I put it in the van because it was really expensive. Yeah, I didn't want to give it up. It <laughs> yeah. Expensive. But somehow he talks to IAB and the chief of police in New York. Then flies back to Miami in that 24-hour period. I mean, he's getting stuff done. He gets a lot done in those 24 hours. And a lot of stuff that we don't see. He got so much done, they couldn't show it all on camera. No, we're not going to show it. (laughs) Back in Miami, I'm going to call it Clarence's Prison? What the hell is this place that he's got Izzy and Luna? Like a warehouse, but... It has like a locked door. It's like, like a basement. Yeah, there's like a prison door in there too. I don't know. It's really weird. It's really run down. There's clearly a hole in the wall where Izzy and Luna could have climbed out. Yeah, that's not. I mean, <laughs> we can talk about that. Like Izzy's not trying very hard. He could have got out of there if he wanted to. Well, I mean, the lock on the door well, doesn't no, have in the a hole in the door jam, so he could have just pushed it open. <laughs> yeah, there's no it. actual so. thing to engage the lock. <laughs> Well, and, and at first I thought Izzy was just free to come and go because he kind of like when the scene starts, he kind of comes in. He's like, I've been up for two days. Like, he just came like storming in, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I didn't even realize like he was locked in there until later in the episode. <laughs> what we find out here is that Clarence has rented computers and is forced, has kidnapped the chemist, Luna and Izzy and is keeping them trapped there because he's going to ransom them back to Wango for a million bucks. But can someone explain to me why the chemist doesn't care that he's been kidnapped? He's like, whatever, just eating all yeah, kinds of crap. And he like- just <laughs> keeps making synthetic cocaine. Like, he just uses the rented computers. Why did he even rent the computers and shit? I don't know. I have no idea. If he just hold them for yeah. ransom. Why did he have them actually make the cocaine? I don't know. <laughs> so many from questions. From this point <laughs> on, yeah, from this point on, we just get more questions. We don't get any answers. <laughs> we just get more questions as we go forward. <laughs> At Wango's, Crockett's retelling his story like his backup. Like, look, I'm not a cop. Trust me. Listen, so, even though I behaved cool. like, like a cop at the club shooting, it's all right. I'm not a cop. But then Izzy and Clarence uh-huh. call and they set up this staged call as if Sangris is beating him up <laughs> and he wants a million dollars for the ransom or he's going to hurt the chemist. Oh, Izzy's acting. <laughs> his acting is so funny. He yes. is the greatest living actor. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this is, is. This is proof. He is. And he shows it. Oh, yeah. He's got this on yeah, his, so, like, reel, and, right? <laughs> like, his great reel. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and once again, Izzy's playing along with it pretty well. So, uh, once again, did not feel like Izzy was kidnapped. No. Um, feels like he's a, 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 a co-conspirator at this point. <laughs> Izzy got Stockholm Syndrome really fast. Well, I think at some point, like when he came in there and they talked and stuff, I think he agreed. Like Izzy's like, yeah, if I get, if you split the money with me or something, I think there had to have been. Because why would Izzy start going like, yeah, sure, okay. Because <laughs> he's always looking for the deal. Well, I'll you know, pretend at to be point, beaten. <laughs> at, at, one, at one point, he, he does make a comment like, we need to renegotiate our deal. There's a backwards deal going on here. I told you Izzy can't be trusted as much as I like him. But. <laughs> they didn't make a point to let us know that there was a deal going on. <laughs> or any other facts about this, this episode. <laughs> yeah, because it keeps getting weirder. Uh-huh. Rocket calls Castillo and says that there's something wrong. He doesn't believe that Sangres has the chemist. There's something wrong here. We go back to Clarence's and the chemist thinks he's made 100% pure synthetic cocaine. So I don't know why Clarence is having to make the cocaine. I barely he needs to stay busy or something. He has to make the cocaine. What? Izzy. Izzy. Why, why is he still cooking cocaine? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. He he's ransoming the chemist back to him. He doesn't. He's not trying to sell cocaine. He's not starting a cocaine business. Well, why is he letting <laughs> this guy do anything other than eat and watch TV? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But he's having to make drugs. He's asked Izzy to test it. Izzy fakes it like he takes it. And then Luna goes to smoke that rock. So and- it's all I didn't even remember that part. I guess like when I think when I was watching the episode today, I didn't even think about it. So Izzy, it's all Izzy's fault then. <laughs> <laughs> he faked it. Uh-huh. Yeah, Izzy fakes it. Then Luna lights up a rock in the in a glass pipe, and it immediately kills him. Like not not even like the first guy, where he holds his head like what's wrong with this thing. He just drops dead. Yeah, he doesn't do the whole like I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> Call life alert. <laughs> My hips broke. So and I mean, at, at, at this point, I am seriously doubting if this guy was even a real chemist. Yeah, he killed everybody. Every time he makes something, <laughs> it just kills people. I mean, basically, he's trying to sell them like. Like baking soda with battery acid in it or something like maybe that's why it's legal it's carpet fresh i'm i'm convinced <laughs> <laughs> clarence still has to prove to wango that he's got because wango asked for i want a photo with today's newspaper with a picture of izzy and luna so now they stage this weekend at bernie's photo with <laughs> luna is. and izzy and they choose out of all the pictures the them having like big old smile on their faces like they don't look like they're kidnapped no, <laughs> because Izzy went through all the pictures they took, which apparently they took like seven hundred. And he's like, "No, I don't like that one. My, I don't like the way I look in that one. I don't like the way I look in that one either." <laughs> what about the dead guy? Do you like the way he looks? Even the dead guy's got a little smirk on his face. <laughs> well, he did die well, doing cocaine. Know, <laughs> the, the whole time they're taking pictures too. I- Izzy explaining under code this, this, and this. We're gonna get life in prison, and then he looks at the picture. He goes, "Hey, actually, this might work." You know, once again, co-conspirator. Yeah, he's going along with it. When we finally leave so, from Clarence's prison, I guess this is what I'm gonna call it. We have we have brief stop at the beach where Tubbs has cornered Melody as she's walking home, and he says, "I have a message for Clarence." But if he's not around, I'm just going to tell you. And end scene. Onto the street. No privacy, clearly. <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, and he says it in such a matter-of-fact way. If he's not here, then I'm going to tell you. Then just and tell it, her. Like, why? It's like in the, the scene in, time. in Glory, where it's like, if this man falls, who will carry the flag? <laughs> if this man falls, who will carry the flag? I ain't so, carrying no flag. If yes. Aaron's ain't here, I'm going to tell Melody. If Melody ain't here, I'm going to tell Tim, if Tim's not here, I'm going to tell the guy <laughs> under the pier. <laughs> I'm going to write it in a note. Stick it under the door. Put it in a bottle. That evening, Clarence finds Tubbs walking out to his car. I don't know where Tubbs is leaving from. Hookers. But- <laughs> 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 she comes point. clean to Tubbs that he's working with Sangres. Now they've kidnapped Luna, but Sangres is spooked. He wants to send him back. There's and he can help coordinate this deal where he can bring down Wango, get the chemist, as long as Clarence gets immunity. Pretty much. That's and that's all, what he says. Yes. yes. And Tubbs says he'll talk to the DA, but that's how that's kind of how the con- the conversation ends. He said in in the beginning of that conversation, Tubbs goes, So I take it you talk to Melody and Clarence goes, yeah. And he's like, okay. Uh, and then they just keep talking. So Tubbs never, I guess, yeah, he didn't know. Clarence say, didn't know what, what, the, what Melody t- knew, basically. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, because he just told Melody that if he's not here, I'm going to tell you. And then here he is, and he doesn't tell him, hey, kind of fix that thing, you know, in New York that got you fired. I kind of took care of it for you. Took yeah. me all day on Saturday, but, but it's done, <laughs> you know. I know it's been five years. And I just and I just squashed it in 24 hours. You know, I probably could have done this five years ago, but I, I took care of it. But, uh, eight years for the record. Eight I'm years. <laughs> eight years. So so Tubbs, Tubbs literally, when he was still his partner, could have taken care of it in about 24 hours. Instead, he lets it go eight years. Guy's wife kills himself, uh, kills herself. He loses his kid. So literally takes him less than 24 hours because he had to fly there first. <laughs> <laughs> well he Some says in the beginning is. so you talked to melody right you so you, i take it you talked to melody because i think he thought like oh he must be talking to me because he knows you know because they're mad at each other why would he come find him so that's what he said the very first thing tub said is goes i take i take it you talk to melody and you know and mm-hmm. then and clarence goes yeah uh-huh <laughs> what did he know then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know she's a stripper and she rides motorcycles in her bikini i already know that <laughs> 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 Clarence 
Max's <laughs> prison, Izzy's getting fed up. He's getting, he's going stir crazy. He kicks the leg off a table, realizes he's got some exposed nails, uses that to pick the lock and escapes from his prison. It's amazing what being locked up with a dead guy will do. <laughs> <laughs> he then the calls cheap Crockett. Ikea furniture being held together with pins. <laughs> He then Did calls Crockett. Did you kick the leg out too and the table didn't go nowhere? Or he didn't fall <laughs> no, over or nothing? That was the best part. That was the best part. <laughs> <laughs> he then calls Crockett and tells him that Luna's dead and it's because of Clarence. And I've done my part. <laughs> like basically like I've told you the truth. I want <laughs> yeah. I want no and I worked with you. <laughs> At the precinct, Tubbs comes in to his desk and Castillo comes walking up and says that, the New York IA is, is reopening the case, but Tubbs like, it doesn't matter. Clarence is involved in the case. He's mixed up in it. He's, I don't know what's going to do. I have a meeting with him at 6 a.m. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Like there's, he wants immunity. Now, mind you, Tubbs has not talked to Crockett yet. Crockett knows that Luna is dead. But yes. Tubbs doesn't know that yet. Yeah. Also, like, there's a uh, when it gets to the end of this, I have a lot of questions, like why they didn't talk about a lot of things. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I have, Pick up I have the questions phone, Crockett. too. <laughs> you have one in your car. Pick it up. <laughs> call. Make a call. I'm sure Tubbs has one in his car too. <laughs> Could have saved a lot of trouble. <laughs> Tubbs also doesn't want backup with this meeting with Clarence. He goes, no, mixed up with it'll, in two gangs. It'll spook him. He'll get spooked, and then he'll be a chump, and then run away. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I guess Clarence ain't no chump. <laughs> or Tubbs ain't no chump. Yeah. <laughs> and Wango's, he's reading the ransom note that's been sent by, quote unquote, Sangries. And he's going to pay the, mil- the million dollars to get his chemist back. But then he also offers to Clarence an extra $150,000 to kill the cop. Which, maybe John understands it. How did he know he was a co- that the cop was involved? Yeah, how did he know that Tubbs was involved? In the, when he read the letter. I don't get it. What was in the letter that made him say, like, yeah. what? We were, like, totally confused on that one. <laughs> From this point on, that I get really confused. Because, so, obviously, Crockett's there. He's undercover. And Tubbs' ex-partner doesn't know Crockett's also uh, undercover. He gets hired to kill Tubbs. So he takes the money, goes home, and we have a scene with the ex-partner and his girlfriend. He's like, it worked. Then I got the money, and his girlfriend's like, oh yeah, Tubbs <laughs> told me that he he, <laughs> he he proved that you were innocent, so like everything's going to be okay. You're going to get your job and, back? Everything's good. <laughs> oh yeah, your wife's going to magically come back from, from the dead. Um, <laughs> it, it's all going to be good. You're going to get you're going to get weekend visitation with the, with the kids. Um, <laughs> big steps. And so just, he is hanging then... out with a stripper. <laughs> but that, but so so then he has this like moment of guilt. You know, like this guilt comes over him, and he's like, "Oh no, I set up tubs." And going to get killed at this meeting tomorrow. So then you stop and you think, I've got the million dollars. I know that the meeting's fake. Even if he feels guilty, he could make one phone call right now. Call Tubbs. Say, hey, don't go. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's not until 6 a.m. the next day. Yeah. Also, or Crockett could have picked up the phone after he heard (laughs) he's in the meeting where they say, like, hey, I want you to kill the cop. I'll give you an extra $150,000 if you kill the cop. Clarence is like, hell yeah. I'll kill him. And so, Crockett's like, ooh, interesting. Okay, so leave yeah, that room, go to so, the payphone, pick it up, and call your partner and tell him it's a setup. Don't but, go. They're going to kill you. But, but why? Clarence has the money. He's got free. Get in a car with your girlfriend. Go to Canada. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't call- have to go to the meeting at all. <laughs> He's already got the money. Yeah, he money. just had to make a call. <laughs> make a phone call. Leave. No one. You, you won't get arrested. You, you got a million dollars. You can go live on a beach somewhere. Instead, we're going to give this a true Miami Vice ending. At a construction site the next day, Clarence shows up, which is it's an interesting trade at 6 a.m. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're industrious people. They don't want yeah, to do it what? in the middle of the night. Yeah, what is with the 6 a.m.? <laughs> Clarence shows up. He sees Tubbs is already there. Wango and his gang are hiding around Crockett again, right next to Wango. Hiding behind a rock. No, <laughs> a pile of dirt. Clarence tell, immediately tells Tubbs, it's a setup. I'm going to pull my gun on you, but no, it's a setup. We we need to get out of here. Crockett punches out Wango and a shootout starts. Now, this is where we we, we vice this thing up. <laughs> they then, because the B team are listening and they come running out with their guns. The old partners, Clarence and Tubbs, get behind the car. They start shooting. Crockett is helping shooting. They murder the entire Wango gang. 
Including the guy with the crazy beard. Yes. Dead. Including Tiger Beard Man. Yes. <laughs> On a side note, the B team took their time to come running out. <laughs> like the shooting's going on. The like, yeah, Tubbs and his we'll partner out. hiding. They, they start shooting. And then like five minutes later, the B team comes out of the van with all the assault weapons, assault <laughs> rifles. He knows why Tech can't move in those pants he's got on. It takes him a while. He's got to maneuver around. They're a little bit tight. <laughs> so once again, Vice kills everyone. No one to arrest. Everything's good, except uh, for Clarence. Uh-uh. I was going to say, uh-uh. I was waiting for that. I've been waiting for this in this episode. He's alive and well. He's not dead. He didn't die. Clarence <laughs> is alive. They did not murder the person, who, the mur- the main person in it. And all they did was punch out Wango or No, Bango, Crockett, sh- oh, Crockett that's right. shoots got, him. That's right. He comes back up. He comes back up, that's and then right, Crockett forgot, shoots yeah. him. But mm-hmm. anyways, Clarence, is, he is alive and going to prison. But, but, but. They, they make it very confusing with Clarence. They have this, you know, him and Tubbs have this whole touchy feely moment, you know, about they, they cleared the air, but he felt guilty. Uh, and he felt guilty about setting him up after he found out what Tubbs did for him, you know. At the end, they go to arrest him, and Tubbs tells him not to put handcuffs on him. And then there's just this kind of awkward, they're just kind of awkwardly standing there. And, and I'm wondering in my head, like, it, is he actually going to jail? Yeah, what is, is that? Kind of of and, that's, and that's how I left at the end of this episode, too, because this is the very end of it, is what this is. This would be a very interesting follow up legally. What Clarence is guilty of, like uh, perhaps that's attempted murder. Right. He didn't actually kill the Luna. Luna killed himself, actually. He just, but it, but he's mm-hmm. obviously guilty of kidnapping. But he might be able to plea deal his way out of this with very minimal prison time because of all the worst things. He didn't actually do any of it. No, he was just like you know, he, he was just there orchestrating stuff like mm-hmm. he was like a key player to that. No, I think what they were trying to say is that he, that Tubbs and him were going to have a relationship now and Tubbs was going to help him because I know you're a good person. Yeah. Like deep down, I know you're that person still in there that was my friend and my and with a cop. You know, even if you're going to prison, yeah. I'm going to help you now. But Crockett does not look like he's no. moved. He's like the whole, the whole time he's just staring no. at him. I want to put the cuffs on this bastard. He was going to kill you. I still get why he went to the meeting at all. He had the million. He had a, he had a million dollars and 150 grand. And the stripper. left with the stripper. <laughs> yeah. She could ride a motorcycle. They could have just rode away out of there. No. <laughs> Well, let's go talk about the music in this episode because we have many, many, many closing thoughts on this episode yes. where there's some problems. Let's go first talk about the music. All right, John, this week's music has a couple of classics and a name that we recognize very well now with Miami Vice. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump right into Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer just, just to get it out of the way because we know we know Peter Gabriel pretty well now, the original lead singer of Genesis singer actually the song sledgehammer was pretty much his biggest hit in his solo career yeah yeah uh, it was off of his it's 80s- like the most poppy song that he's done too yeah uh it was off his 86 album so it, it was his best selling release it went triple platinum it, it was his most successful single it actually won nine mtv music awards and it actually to this day remains the most played music video in history uh, on mtv TV, which I don't think is ever going to change. They don't play music anymore. Um, <laughs> There's no chance to beat it. <laughs> it was also nominated for three Grammys. Didn't win any, but it was nominated. <laughs> I recognize the Sledgehammer song, and it's just probably because it's the most normal sounding Peter Gabriel <laughs> song. <laughs> it was also his the number one hit in the U.S. A couple things you might not know about the song. It features uh, Wayne Jackson does the horn section part of the song. And he was of a band called the Memphis Horns. At that time, he was actually touring with Otis Redding. So he was actually kind of a big deal as a session musician. And the part that he did, the Shakahachi intro, I I guess is how you pronounce it. It was actually sampled in 93 by Naughty by Nature for their hit Hip hop hooray. But now that we got a little bit of P- Peter Gabriel out of the way, let- let's talk about the other songs. Uh, we have Born to Be Wild by Steppenwolf, who is a Canadian rock band, prominent from 68 to 72, but they actually, um, well, some 
adoration of the band still tours today. So but we'll I, get to that. I would say, hearing now that they're Canadian, that I suspect how born to be wild they actually are. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny that you bring that up because they were originally formed as Jack London and the Sparrows. <laughs> but that's in Canada. <laughs> yes, total total bikers. Born to Be Wild was their third single released after they changed their name to Steppenwolf. Born to Be Wild was their third single ever released, and it was used in the 1969 movie Easy Rider with uh, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, and Jack Nicholson, which is just a hugely iconic uh, movie. That's basically about bikers. First so, popular movie to expose the country to the alternative hippie lifestyle. I'm a big fan of the movie. Yeah. Melissa, what are your thoughts on that movie? I hated that movie. <laughs> no, 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 no qualms about that. I hated that movie. <laughs> Apparently, I would not so, have been down with the hippie lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. So because of, because of that, the song reached number two on the Hot 100. Basically aligned them with that culture. That was pretty much what set them to be kind of looked at as a biker band. So the next song they would, the next album they would release would feature the song Magic Carpet Ride, which would go mm-hmm. to number three. The other song they're famous for, Rock Me. They really just kind of struck gold just right out the gate. Very early on, there were several changes to the group's personnel. Nick St. Nicholas, who had, uh, I want to say he was, the, uh, he joined the band. I don't, I, don't, he, I don't believe he was an original member. He would be let go in the middle of 1970. He had a habit of wearing boo-boos and coftons on stage. <laughs> and Kay, he felt like it went against the band's image, which was wearing like leather vests and being like cool rock and roll bikers, even though they are Canadians who were originally in a band called the Sparrows. <laughs> Not only that, but when you see um, them, like you, if you ever seen their live performances, like they look very uncomfortable in the clothing and the sunglasses on stage and stuff. They look like people who are trying too hard. Yeah. Yeah, early on, kicking the member out because he didn't look the part because that's like Born to be Wild. That was what made him famous for Easy Rider in that movie, you know? So it's like, we have to be bikers, even though we're not. Another member that was kicked out of the band, basically, was Rushton Morive, who was the bassist. And he was fired for missing gigs in 1968 after he became afraid to return to L.A. because his girlfriend had convinced him that it was going to be leveled by an earthquake and fall into the sea. <laughs> <laughs> the band would pretty much have their biggest time from 68 to 72. They would break up after a farewell show on Valentine's Day in 1972. John Kay would have a brief solo career. In 74, they would have a reunion album release, and they would reunite until 76. And then from 76 to 80, some of the other band members would form a revival act called New Steppenwolf, and they would not be very well received. In fact, Rolling Stone would call them a bogus version of Steppenwolf. (laughs) And ultimately, they would be sued by John Kay, even though he originally licensed them to use the name. And those legal disputes (laughs) would continue until 2000. Since 1980, John Kay with an entirely reformed Steppenwolf, has continued to play shows. In fact, they were just up here in my area about two months ago. So. Coming to a county fair near you. <laughs> Let's move on to Tequila by The Champ. So it is that tequila. Everyone should know that song. It is all over the place when it comes to pop culture. It was used in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the original 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. It was used in Cheech and Chong's next movie. It was used in The Sandlot, The Happy Days TV show, and a bunch of other commercials and stuff. Everyone should know the song. You've heard it at some point in time. Exactly. It is probably the most famous instrumental, like, ever. So, the Champs were a band formed of... Basically, ses- session musicians, the champs were made up of basically just professional for hire musicians. And they were led by Danny Flores, a.k.a. Chuck Rio, and Dave Burgess. The band, the champs, 
They were named after Gene Autry's champion racehorse. He was the one who actually owned the 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 record label at the time. And the they brought in these session musicians. And Danny Flores, who originally wrote the song Tequila, and he's actually kind of known as like the godfather of Latino rock. So they brought him in and they recorded Tequila and a few other things, just trying to find a hit. And just by chance, the the instrumental Tequila was recorded last. And as just kind of a filler for the B-side of the album, a DJ happened to play it once in 1957. And, I mean, within three weeks, it went straight to number one on both the pop and R&B charts. They're actually the first group to go number one with an in- instrumental as their first hit. So in 1959, they would win a Grammy for Tequila for Best R&B Performance. It would go on to sell over a million records and go gold. But the band would not last very much longer. In so conflicts between Flores and Burgess over the band's direction in the early 60s would lead to Flores' departure. Uh, Flores would actually sign away his rights to the Tequila song. And ultimately, he wouldn't make any money from the royalties. So wow. all of those things I mentioned, so all of those things I mentioned, Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Ninja Turtles, he wouldn't see money from any of it. Eventually, in the early 2000s, he would receive some royalties from some of the European sales, but that is it. So, And what's funny is, Flores is actually the guy that says tequila in the song. It's spoken three times in the song. <laughs> three words like spoken song, in the song. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the whole song. He wrote the song. He says tequila in the song. Everything was done by him. He made no money off of it. Basically, he'd go on it, it, to have a career as a session musician. A few more things about them. One, the reason why uh, I said AKA Chuck Rio is that because he was actually under contract as a session musician for another record label, they had to credit it to Chuck Rio instead of Danny Flores for, for legal reasons. Something else is that later, it, it, because the camps w- moved on after Danny Flores left under the direction of Dave Burgess, Glenn Campbell would actually join in 1960 as one of his very first kind of music gigs. Glenn Campbell, who actually just passed away at the age of 81, back on August 8th. He's a singer, musician, TV host, and an actor, and he's actually had uh, just a massive career. I thought that was kind of pretty interesting there, that he was tied to the champ. And also, I mentioned that they were named after Gene Autry's champion horse. Just in case you're not aware who Gene Autry is, he spent three decades in movie and TV as a singing cowboy. Um, um, as a yeah. tidbit, I'm related to him. I'm really? related to Gene Autry. Shut up. Really? I'm serious. My <laughs> grandfather, my mom's father, was like somehow related, like, I don't know, like second cousin to him or third cousin Shut to up. Him. So you're saying we were, you are somehow related to the former mayor of Fresno? No. <laughs> No, that's Bubba. <laughs> oh yeah, that's oh my god. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah, but she, yes, um, my I don't know how it is. I have to ask my mom again. But we are seriously related to Gene Autry. <laughs> I am. Yep. Really? Second cousin. Yeah, he was. He's related to my grandfather's mother. They're cousins. So I don't know how that makes. So sense. therefore, <laughs> your cousin several times removed from Bubba. Yeah, Bubba Autry. Or from his son. <laughs> yeah. Who was the mayor, the mayor of Fresno? <laughs> oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Didn't think about that. Yeah. No. <laughs> Wow, that, that's crazy. You see, hey, did, did you ever go to any Angels baseball games? Because he owned uh, no, the no. Angels baseball team from 1961 to 97. Yeah, no, I don't um, even know if it's true. That's just something that's been passed down by like, like my grandfather's family that they're related to him. I don't know. Who knows? Did you ever meet a horse named Champ? No, I didn't. <laughs> I've never met a horse ever. No. <laughs> Once again, did, did one of your grandparents have a thing for s- singing cowboys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Once again, the music segment makes a turn none of us were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's go so. give our final thoughts on this episode because I think we have many. All right, I'm going to kick off again this week for the final thoughts because I think I'm going to be easier on the episode than than you guys are. I actually enjoyed this episode. I thought it was really good. Now, I say it's really good because Izzy is amazing in this episode and he really does save 
the plot holes that are happening in this. There's several scenes where it's laugh out loud, Izzy. Especially the part where they come, where you come walking on him. He's locked up in Clarence's prison for the first time. He's got this big old stupid smile on his face, and he's yeah. looking through the little window in the yeah. door. <laughs> it's just, it, he's been, he's so fantastic in this episode. And yes, there's some plot holes. I think those all relate back to that the teleplay writers were the producers, so they came in and kind of rescued this episode. That took a weird turn somewhere in the original writing to what they filmed. Oh, no, like I had a lot of fun with this episode. It reminded me a lot of what we love from season one of Miami Vice. And so I actually had a lot of fun with this episode. It was it was pretty interesting. I was happy that it was a tub story, even though it was kind of a weak tub story. I kind of want Valerie to come back if we're going to do a tub story, but this was all right. But yeah, I had a lot of fun with this episode. John, what are your final thoughts on this one? I just... Oh. <laughs> um, like I said, it just uh oh, <laughs> it, it it just really felt out of like I said earlier, it was, it was odd. It really felt out of sequence. I don't know if it bothered me because it was like Ubs had this weird relationship with his ex partner, or the fact that like everything kind of fell apart at the end, like plot wise. The guy they kidnapped dies because he's for some reason still making synthetic cocaine. The guy gets the money and basically gets away, and then out of Guilt decides to go to the meeting anyway and says just taking off with the money. It was such a poor plan anyway because, like, it, he was supposed to be getting revenge on Tubbs. And they never kind of really worked out how he was going to get revenge except for that he was going to go to the meeting and kill him, I, I'm assuming. Well, death is like, the I ultimate just... revenge. <laughs> Got you, sucker, just, you're it dead. It just seemed a net... Uh, I, so, I mean, there's the scene where he's with his girlfriend and he's got the money, nothing after that really makes sense. And, and then they go to that last scene and everything's so unnecessary. And then it's just like a Vice episode. Let's just kill everybody and we'll just call it a day. <laughs> I was a little disappointed by the episode. I did enjoy the antics of Izzy Moreno, but I also missed not having the girls in the episode at all. Yeah, uh, it's not uh, even like they just like breeze by in the hallway. Like you don't see them at all. No, they're just gone. Like they're on vacation. <laughs> um, they're pretending to be hookers somewhere else that that week. Fort Lauderdale. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It must be spring break. Uh, Izzy wasn't enough to make up for the plot holes and, and for the girls being gone and just just all the uncomfortableness to some of the scenes. I didn't really like it. Well, Melissa, what are your final thoughts? This is one of those episodes that I don't have a strong feeling about either way. Um, I love that it has Izzy in it. Uh, I like the episode. I don't think it's a bad episode. I just think it's it's completely different. It's off from the feeling of season three. Mm-hmm. That would be my thing. Like, if this was in season one, it would have been like, you wouldn't even blink an eye at it. Like, oh, it's a funny story that doesn't really add up. And it's kind of zany. And there's just, you know, strange connection between (laughs) Tubbs and his partner going on here. (laughs) But because it's in season three, which is like has been already out of the gate, such a strong season, it feels like really badly out of place. And you notice all the plot holes and you notice like, why is, why is Izzy so excited to be a prisoner somewhere? <laughs> what is going on in his life? And, he's like, and I will say that there is no ladies in this one. And I, yeah, they are missed because, you, you know, you miss their presence. But the following episode is very Trudy, especially heavy, but it's very ladies heavy. It's, it centers around the ladies. So the very next episode, you get a big dose of the ladies. They had to save them up. Yeah, I mean, you can't give them all. You can't put them in every episode. (laughs) (laughs) What do they pay them by the word? Like, we got to skip this episode. They're getting too expensive. (laughs) So I don't have a feeling either way. It's, eh. It's there. I'm, I'm like you that one time. You're like, eh, it happened. It was a That's thing. funny. We covered the entire spectrum from good to meh to bad. So <laughs> we, we, we covered the whole thing. We'd love to hear from you and what your thoughts are because we, we covered the whole thing. Help break the tiebreaker <laughs> <laughs> on this. What are your thoughts on this episode? Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. And that is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out the website. Go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe to this show. You can find all the ways to contact us as well. That includes Facebook and Twitter and emails I mentioned, just I just mentioned, go with the heat at gmail.com. We would love, love, love to hear from you. We still want to hear from you for what you think of the potential Miami Vice reboot. Email us and let us know what you think. We're going to read through them. We'll pick some out. We'll read them here on the show. We'll add it to the discussion on what it could mean for a Miami Vice reboot, especially with the Vin Diesel connection. However strange that is. 
<laughs> be sure that on your podcast platform of choice, you go ahead and give us a review. It helps people to find the show. And you know what helps them find it the most? It's if you give it the five stars or the two thumbs up or whatever the highest rating is on that podcast platform or ch- on that podcatcher platform of choice. I'm just going to ask for it. I'm just going to ask <laughs> for it. Tell, tell everyone how great we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.